Hello everybody, my name is Jared Bendis, and this is Public Speaking and Presentation Design, also known as PowerPoint doesn't have to be painful, ugly, or boring. That's just the original title of this talk. All right, how many of you have never made a PowerPoint before? None of you? Well, great, I'm done. This is easy. That's not why you're here. And you know, when you think about that, you're not here for me to teach you how to make PowerPoint. You already know how to make PowerPoint. You're not here for me to teach you how to stand in front of a crowd. Well, maybe you are. The idea is very simply this. You're here because you want to stand out. You're here because you don't want to be bad. Bad is bad. There's a really weird thing that's happened over the years. is TED Talks. I, I love TED Talks. But TED Talks have confused my students. They make them think that if I give them, if I move the podium away and just let them walk around the stage, they're going to be good. No, they're going to be worse. The reason that TED Talks are good is because good speakers speak at them. It's my job today to get you to think about what bad presentations look like. And you've seen them before. You've all sat through them all. They've all gnawed at your psyche until you've tuned them out and said, God, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. And then you've stood up and done something just as bad. Hopefully not. So we want to talk a lot about what's going on with good presentation design. Good speaking. Well, what is PowerPoint? It's the first question I ask everybody. What is PowerPoint? Like, it's a program. Eh, fine, it's a program. But what do we use PowerPoint for? I know some people use PowerPoint as a desktop publishing tool. They make posters in PowerPoint. That's not what we're doing today. We're talking about this, speaking to an audience. To an audience. You need an audience. A speaker needs an audience. You are my audience. You're like, there's no audience there. The blue glow of the camera is my audience today. And I know you're out there, and I know you're listening, and I'm speaking right to you. What did people... What did, PowerPoint. What did people use before PowerPoint? The war, the age of computers, not that old. Oh, before that, they used slides. As a matter of fact, we call these slides, but they're not slides. It's a metaphor for slides. And before that, they used overhead projectors. And before that, they used whiteboards and chalkboards. And they used, uh, you know, I don't know, dirt and sticks. Or I feel the original PowerPoint is gesticulation hand movements, you know, things like that, body language. That's the original PowerPoint. Let's be practical here. I've been speaking now for two and a half minutes. Do you think that I need these slides? Do you think I couldn't just, like, make the picture bigger and just go, hey, everybody, I'm Jared, and I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes? I know how to speak to an audience, hopefully. Otherwise, you'll have tuned me out already. The idea is that we use PowerPoint as what I call speaker support. These slides are here to help me. They're here to reinforce the argument, or maybe there's something for you to hide behind. Something that people should look at instead of you. Nothing wrong with looking at you. you got to learn to hold the audience. PowerPoint is about... Presentations are about a three-way conversation between your slides, your audience, and yourself. And the speaker, speaker support, the speaker, me, has to respect the audience and has to respect the slides. I wrote these slides, and I've got to be in charge of these slides. It's very important because sometimes you're going to see a presentation and go, who wrote this thing? It doesn't look like the speaker wrote his own slides. Sometimes that's true. And if it doesn't look like they wrote their own slides, we've got a problem. PowerPoint shouldn't be tacky. Or hurt the eyes. I, people people hate this slide. People love this slide. They go, why are you going to show us to spin things? I'm not. I'm never going to show you how to spin things. Ever. This is a horrible slide. PowerPoint shouldn't make you read. Now, the funny part is, is whenever this slide comes up, people laugh. And they go, ah, oh, but I'm going to spend time on it. Of course, PowerPoint shouldn't make you read. But everybody has seen a slide like this. And a lot of you are guilty of slides like this. But, but, but. No buts. I want to analyze this for a moment. Imagine that we were in a giant theater full of people. And I put the slide up on the screen. Can most people read it? Only the people in the front row can read it. The people in the back row can't read it. That's right. I have divided the audience into the haves and the have-nots. What a horrible thing to do. The haves and the have-nots in your audience. But even worse than that, let's just say that the front row can read it. Because it's big in the front row. Well, guess what? 
you read to yourself faster than you, you read aloud. So while I'm reading this, you're tuning me out. And by the time you've tuned back in, you've already read it. So for the first half, you're ignoring me. For the second half, I'm redundant. It's a terrible thing to be. You're like, but I need to give the, the soliloquy from Hamlet. First of all, if you did, if you really needed to live, deliver the soliloquy from Hamlet, then do it. Don't put the words up on the screen. Put a picture of Bill Shakespeare up there and just deliver the soliloquy. Or, if it is an important quote and you want the audience to read it and you can get it big enough, let them read it. Let them read it. So here's a quote. There you go. Why should you read everything you see on the screen verbatim? It's condescending and it's terrible. There should be a relationship here and this is a bad relationship. Content comes first, pretty comes second. This is really, really important because I heard a comedian once say that the, the waiter brings him the, 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 the meal and he looks down on the plate and he's like, hey, what's that? Oh, it's a garnish. Garnish? What's a garnish? Makes your plate look better. What are you talking about? That's parsley. You know, know what made my plate look better? Three shrimp. That made my plate look better. You've got to remember that you're in the shrimp business. You're in the content business. And if you've got time left over, I want you to make your presentation smarter, clearer, pretty. That's three buttons when we're done. This is not your wheelhouse. Your wheelhouse is to communicate information effectively. And that's by being simple. Content comes first, pretty comes second. You're a content expert. But let's talk pretty, because I'm not stupid. That's why you're here. You're here because you think that visual design, the graphic design, is going to somehow win over the day. And by the way, in some ways it will, but not in the way that you think. Because design is about convention. And convention is about giving people what they're ready to accept. There literally is a formula. There is an equation. If I'm giving a presentation, I'm wearing a tie and I'm wearing a jacket. By the way, the worst thing that anybody could ever say to me when I'm done with the presentation is, you know, I, I've got to be honest with you, 90 minutes of this, I got to know. Where'd you get the tie? What? Literally, you're going to talk about my tie? If somebody were to walk up to me and say, great slides, that's an insult. Great presentation, that's a compliment. At the end of the day, the design convention should be so invisible that it's seamless. They're not going to talk about it. I mean, you might sit there and go, wow, that was really, really slick because it was so simple and it was so clear. That's lovely. But that should be a secondary characteristic. It should almost be matter of fact. When you read a novel, you're like, oh, my God, the paper. Oh, the paper. No, you're like, it was a great book. If you're looking at the paper, there's something wrong. So we need to understand about design convention. And one of the first things I always tell my students is, is the rule of design convention is that we bend, not break. We're not avant-garde. We're not doing something wonderful. The PowerPoint itself is not a work of art. It is a delivery mechanism for your content. That being said, let's start with fonts. There are two schools of fonts. Serif fonts look like this. Sans serif fonts look like this. So what's a serif? A serif are the little curly cues. There they are, those little curly cues. Sans serif means without, without the little curly cues. This font is Times New Roman. This font is Arial. The great debate! Times New Roman versus Arial. Now let's be practical here. Books are written in serif fonts. They're not written in Times New Roman, by the way. It's such an academic font. Papers are written in Times New Roman. Books are written in the Garamond, or they're written in a Georgia, or a Bookman. This is Arial. Which font do I use? Which font is better? Well, one of the rules of fonts is that the serifs slow down your eyes. Serif fonts take longer to read, but the reading comprehension increases. The sans serif fonts are so smooth, your eyes almost glaze over them. Now, that's true for a book, but a presentation? The reality of it is these words have been on the screen for a very long time in the relativeness of the size of the words. They've been on enough for you to encode them. They didn't flash up and go away. These aren't flashcards. It doesn't matter whether you want to use serif or sans serif fonts. What you should know is, is they don't mix very well. It's like wearing polka dots and stripes. It's kind of tacky. So you want to keep serif with serif and sans serif with sans serif and try to make things look pretty good. By the way, the one in the middle... It's called a bubble font. Ooh, beware the bubble fonts. Bubble fonts are so ornate. They're so pretty. You see the picture before the word. They're great for things like free or sale or now or here, but they're not good for anything you want people to really read first. They're the picture before the word. 
And with that being said, I have to tell you something really, really awful. And that is papyrus is evil. And I don't mean papyrus as in paper. I mean papyrus as in this font called papyrus. It's evil. Don't think you should ever, ever use this font. Sorry, we don't use it. But even to use it in this demo, I had to make it really, really big. One of the other things, I had a prof years ago, I had a professor who loved Papyrus so much. They did an entire research poster in Papyrus, and people were like going up to read it. He's like, see, they're reading it. I go, no, they're not reading it. But I can read it because you wrote it. The number one thing about design is, is that you have to understand that you know what you're going to say. You know what's on the screen. You know what you're trying to sell. That's the problem. And that problem is going to come up later on as well. Let's move on to images. Your first instinct with images is to fill the screen. If you notice, by the way, the screen I'm using is a sort of a square inside of a rectangle. It's the, the old squarish aspect ratio of 4 by 3. By the way, are all of your pictures an aspect ratio of 4 by 3? No. Which means if you want them all to fill the screen, you'd have cropped them all to 4 by 3, which, by the way, you don't want to do. Matter of fact, this image here is an unhealthy crop. The reason I say it's an unhealthy crop is that if you look, your eye gets trapped over here, goes over the head, and stops at the paw because the paw has been cut off. Or I come down here and my eye gets trapped on here and it gets trapped again by this paw and it gets trapped again. It's a bad crop. Are you going to crop all of your images to exactly fit the screen? Fill the screen? No. And the reason is very simply this. When it comes to PowerPoint, design does not trump content. We are not going to crop our image to make it fit our screen. Now, if this was a video, we might actually do that. If this is a video, we actually might say that design does trump content, that design is first, and we have to work our design around it. But that's not here. Here we want to be very specific that when it comes to presentations, we never want to sacrifice our content for our design. So instead of filling the screen, what about fitting the screen? Which basically means don't crop the image, but make it come up to the edges. And of course, what ends up happening here, my window aside, what ends up happening here is, is that our image touches the edge of the screen and we get these white bars on the top and bottom. And while now my image can, my eye can travel around the paw, it's very nice to see it relax there, you'll notice that there is a eye spot that your eyes do get trapped in the top and bottom. So one of the ways that we free that is we want to give our eyes room to travel. So I put mats around an image, mats around a photograph. There we go. And now that my eyes have room to travel, you'll see the eye can go around the photo on the outside and also can go around the photo on the inside. And that makes our life a lot easier. You don't need to fill the screen. And look, but I want it to be big. Trust me, it's big. You're going to be presenting on a larger screen than you are at home. It's going to be bigger. Bigger. That's what, all that matters. But what about this white background? Well, this white background is a terrible background. And I'll be honest with you, it's a terrible background because it's projected light. It's bright and in your face. So if white's no good, what about black? Is that black? Is it really black? Look on your screen. Look at your monitor. Uh, my monitor's got an outer black bezel on it. And you know what? When I look at the outer black bezel, that screen is not as black as that outer black bezel because there really isn't black on a computer monitor. It's only as black as it can get, which is a dark, 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 dark gray. And the reality of it is, is while black can work in a theatric environment, if I were to turn off all the lights in my room right now, oh my God, it would be black. I'm rarely presenting in a room that is all black, and I do miss some stylized things, which we'll get to in a minute. I don't like a white background, and I don't like a black background, so what about a gray ba No, God, no. Never a gray background. Actually, I love when I give this presentation in person, because when I do it where there's a projector, I never know what color it's going to be. Because it's never really gray. This is a neutral gray. But when I'm projecting it, it could be anywhere from red to green to blue, depending on how old the projector is where I'm presenting. That's always a fun one right there. The other is, have you ever walked into a gray room? Have you ever walked into a room where the walls are painted gray? It's oppressive. Art museum walls aren't gray. Art museum walls are some contrasting color. Matter of fact, I want you to think about the last time you went to the art museum. What were the colors? And the funny part is, if you have to think about it, that's a good thing because you weren't supposed to be looking at the walls. It was supposed to be invisible to what you were doing. That's like my tie. You're not supposed to be looking at my tie. You're supposed to be thinking about what I'm saying and looking at the images I'm presenting you. If you're thinking about my tie, I shouldn't have worn that tie. Now, this next slide is a joke. 
this next slide is a joke. I always have to be careful about this. Because what you want to do is you want to break up the space. And by breaking up the space, what you do is, is you end up creating what's called the foreground coming forward and the background going backwards. You see, if you look at this gray bar around my image, it kind of comes forward a bit. But if I want my image to pop, I can break up the space with this humorous rainbow gradient. Now I say humorous rainbow gradient, you would never use the rainbow gradient as your image, but a serious gradient, something subtle, actually will make your image move forward. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to have the, the foreground be foreground, foreground and the background be background. That makes my life a lot easier. So there you go. The reality of it is, is any low contrast texture will do. I say low contrast, it could be low contrast in the light range, or it could be low contrast in the dark range. But low contrast is really important. It can't be a full photograph because those have full contrast. You need things that will actually stand out from. Um, I love this one. It's this, this woven one. One of my students was doing a, a PowerPoint presentation on their trip to North Africa, and they actually used this woven background and these Arabic bullets. And it was great because there was some real context to the background. Now, be honest with you, when your turn comes to pick a background, you're not going to change it every image like I did. This is literally demonstration purposes only. You're going to pick one background and you're going to stick with it the entire time. And what that does is something very, very powerful that you don't get on a solid block background. And that is you thread these images together as part of your presentation. That's what a theme gives you. A theme reminds people that they're watching your presentation, that it's been threaded together with something and by you. If they're all black background, but you're not going to this image is by itself. No, I don't want it to be by itself. I want this image to be part of a series. And the best way to remind people it's part of a series is to brand it as part of a series using an appropriate but very subtle theme. Good. Let's move on to image borders. I'm going to show you a picture of myself as a younger man. Here it is. Now this picture, by the way, is actually low resolution now that I look, think about it. This picture is really interesting because it bleeds into the, the background. If you look over here, my neck bleeds into the background. And because there's dark and there's medium and there's light, no matter what happened, this image is going to bleed somewhere into a background. And I don't want it to bleed into a background. I want it to stand out. And one of the greatest ways to make it stand out, and watch this, I'm going to make it stand out so simply by going bam, with a thin black line. Look at that. It just pops out a little bit. Now, when I say thin black line, I do not mean thinnest black line. Never use a one pixel line because it could vibrate when you project it. You want to make sure you test everything if you can in front of a projector. What it looks like on the screen may shift a little bit when you project, something that people don't realize. In addition to that, if I don't use a thin black line, I might decide to go for a thick blue line. Look at that. Look how it stands out. Now, when it comes to doing this, again, you're not going to do a different border on every single image. You're going to pick one border and thematically go with it. Now, we've got a conundrum in front of us. Let's say you've got 100 images in your PowerPoint, and the thick blue border only works on 95 of them. What do you do? Now, there are different options here. You could, you could do the insanity one and go, find one that works for everything, and that may never happen. It may never work. I love when people go, well, delete those five pictures. That's like saying the shoe doesn't fit. Get me an X. Remember, I told you we do not sacrifice content for design. Not here we don't. So we're never going to remove our content because the design doesn't fit. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, the blue border worked for these 95 images. And for the five that it doesn't, we're going to use a black border. Simple as that. Remember, when it comes to design, they're your rules to make and they're your rules to break. As a teacher, I want you to think about why did you do that? Simple as that. Design for me is about making choices that are not just arbitrary. They're about what solutions am I trying to achieve? I need a border so it stands out. I need a border that works for as much as I can and a secondary border for the ones that didn't work. Simple as that. I ask my students all the time, why did you do that? And if the answer is, oh, I don't know, well, that's not good enough. Why did you do that? I thought it looked good. Good answer. I'm going to tell you the secret to PowerPoint right here. And the funny part is, is I've been giving this presentation for years. Matter of fact, I once had to give this presentation seven times over three days. And I never know when I'm going to tell this exact piece of information, but I'm going to tell it right here, right now. The secret to all presentations is your presentation is boring to you. And how could it not be? 
Remember, you know what's coming next. You can't write a whodunit and not know who done it. Stop trying to entertain yourself. You're not your target audience. And as soon as you realize that, you're going to stop doing stupid stuff in the PowerPoint that you think makes it more interesting. You make it more interesting by giving unique and novel content that people are looking for in an exciting and informative way. Not by making things spin in rainbows and all that type of stuff. That's because you're bored with your own content. And again, get over it. You're not your own audience. And as soon as you learn that, as soon as you learn that your audience is out there, that your thrill isn't from watching the PowerPoint, but seeing the gleams in their eyes, that's a lot different. Now, let's talk about images. Good images are high resolution and low compression. If you want to know more about images, you should take my digital imaging workshop, also on YouTube. Now, good images are high resolution, low compression. This is a good image. By the way, this is my friend Dermot. I've been using this image for almost 20 years. I don't think he knows it. Um, and now he will because it's on the internet. This is my friend Dermot. We are in Ireland. That is Guinness. This is a good image. Now, interestingly enough, this is a bad version of the same image. It's low resolution and highly compressed. Now, it used to be that, of course, all the images we got off the internet would be, you know, highly compressed and low resolution. Now, at least we are in another world where we can actually get high resolution images. But we do need to realize there's two other versions of this. This is a low resolution image, and you can see, by the way, it's very fuzzy. You can't read his name tag. And this is a highly compressed image, and you can see he's got, like, digital worry lines on this stuff. So again, it's, it, it's good to think about sort of our image sources and, of course, what kind of quality we're dealing with along the way. For your PowerPoint, where do you get those pictures? I know what you're saying. I can hear you all the way. Google! There's no place called Google. Well, there is a building called Google, but it's not filled with images. Google Images isn't a place. Google Images is a how. That's like going, where'd you get the books? The library. No, 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 no. And you wouldn't put that in a bibliography, would you? No. The idea is very simply this. It's a method. It's a method. I went to the library to get the books, but you wouldn't cite the library. You cite the book. Now, the question that comes up now when it comes to the images in your PowerPoint is, is it legal? And always my students are like, I don't know. Maybe. If you cite it, uh, probably not. It's time to have some confidence about our usage of images in our PowerPoint presentations. First of all, the citation thing is not about right or wrong. It's not about legality. If I were to steal your watch and tell everybody, you know this watch? Stole from that guy. That's a citation. It wouldn't make you feel any better, but at least I was honest about where I got it from. Citations are an academic integrity thing. We require them by whatever citation settings you're required to follow. And that is, if your professor says, please give me a list of all your images, you're going to do that. And that's going to be a citation. But the question is one of legality. And the reality of it is, is that every image you find on the internet is owned by someone, for the most part. Because the moment it's been created, a copyright was associated with it. Now, if you're looking for absolutely free media, you can watch my video on how to do free media. But this is not that situation. Because there is something, and let's assume that every image we find, most images we find, are owned by somebody and copyrighted by somebody. There is a way in which we override copyright, where we steal, steal, steal images from other people, use them without permission in our materials. And those uses are called fair use. Now, it only works under certain parameters. If it's not fair use, it's just theft and you know bad things happen. But fair use allows us in an educational setting, and that is a face-to-face -face educational setting, face-to-face -face educational setting, closed. Oh, wait, this isn't closed. You're watching this on the internet. So in other situations, it would be a face-to-face -face closed situation, us to use copyrighted images as part of our contextual conversation, criticism, things like that. And that is one of the exemptions. It's called fair use exemption. It is not a right, by the way. What it is, it is a legal defense in court. The judge goes, why did you steal that picture for your PowerPoint? And you say, your honor, I was teaching. This was the exemplar. I needed it. I did it in an educational setting. It was closed, and that's what I did. And generally, that works. Does that mean I can put it on my website afterwards? Nope. Does that mean I can put it on YouTube afterwards? Nope. So I want to be very, very clear here. You can, if you are talking about the proper images, if you're talking about what you're dealing with, if it is contextual and important to your message, 
use almost anything you want from almost anywhere you want as long as it is what you're supposed to be talking about closed and not published outside this is very very different can you then put it on YouTube no can you then put it on your website no so I need you to know where those lines are going in so by all means go to Google Images find the images you want put them in here if you want but just realize that you're doing it because this fair use education exemption and I am not a lawyer and if you do other things with them they're not coming after me they're coming after you because I told you not to do it but again face-to-face -face instruction or zoom giving a presentation talking about the content you're talking about use the images that you need to use one caveat if you find images that are watermarked you know, those big swirls that saying please buy me don't use them it's tacky just don't use images that you're supposed to buy that have big watermarks on them move along find something else all right next hey what's different by the way I don't drink alcohol I'm not drunk in this photograph uh, it's, it's a very funny story by the way I uh, I was there and I was I said to somebody like "Ooh, I want to have some Guinness and they're like give them a pint and I'm like uh, make it a half pint and they laughed and thought I was kidding and handed me a pint and I took a sip and put it down and they're like are you gonna drink that I'm like I don't drink like why didn't you order a glass I'm like I asked for a half pint they go we thought you were kidding don't worry I was in Ireland someone drank it now the question is is what's the where's Waldo of the day what's the difference in these two pictures if you stare for a moment somebody's gonna say that something's brighter there's different things my favorite by the way is when I do this in front of an audience the right half of the room says the right one is brighter and the left half of the room says the left one is brighter because with DLP projectors the light the side of the room you're on is always brighter which is a great thing you should know about if you're ever doing a comparison and it's being projected I don't know how that works with laser projectors but it is something you should be aware of that when you're in a room often you see things skewed by where you're sitting no what well, the really big one here is that people are gonna notice a little bit of green and they're gonna say this green is here and it's not over here which is true which technically means that my face is slightly bigger here than here which is true but the real big difference here is this is crooked and this is straight this image is straighter than this image and that's it within every picture is a better picture and it's your job to find it by the way don't rotate and fail to crop you want to rotate and crop and again we talk about how to make every picture look a little bit better obviously I still look like I'm drunk but I'm not because I literally sipped the beer that was it all right so this image is good and this image is better and it's always funny because uh, a friend of mine told me years ago he's like better is the enemy of good I'm like wow that is like epic I love that and he's like my brother said that then a few years later someone's like dude that's Voltaire so I went up to the professor and I said better is the enemy of good that's Voltaire and he's like he stole it from my brother but I want you to realize that for the most part you're giving a presentation the images are gonna go by fairly quickly the projecting space you're gonna be on is unknown you don't know if you're going to be on a big projector or a little projector on a screen or it's going to be color calibrated you can only work so much into it get the images as good as you can get them but don't go crazy this isn't a print book now if you were to include video in your PowerPoint then I would make sure that the video starts paused and that you introduce your video clip very very important now at this point I would normally press play and play a clip from the bean movie which I think is one of the greatest things on presentation design there is but because this video is going to end up on YouTube I am going to not present with the video because I respect copyright now that being said one of the things that's really important is if I were to press play right now do you know what I would do I would shut up and watch the video I would shut up and let the video play many years ago I was with a friend of mine and I said to him before the presentation went on I go when the video plays shut up just let the video play we are letting the video play I press play in the video and he jumped up and started talking in front of me oh my god he kept talking and talking and talking and as he was talking I saw something in the audience's eyes I saw them wish him away they wished he would shut up they wished he would sit down and you know what they don't ever unwish you away once the audience wishes you would go away they never want you to come back so you never ever 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 put yourself in a position where you don't respect the media if you're gonna play a video clip let them watch the video clip when it's over 
Now, another friend of mine had a situation where he had a video clip he wanted to show, but the audio was garbled. And he so he spent his time between the video clip. I apologize. I'm so sorry. The audio is garbled. And I'm like, you're an idiot. And he's like, what do you mean? I go, watch this. And I went up and I muted the audio in his video clip. And he, I said, listen, there's, there's no audio in the video. Now you can talk over it. No one's going to be mad at you because now they need you. You're a dependent variable. You're part of the show. You're not competing with your media. Don't compete with your media. By the way, don't compete with your presentation at all. If you compete with your media, if you compete with your presentation, you will lose every time. If you put text on the screen, they will read it faster than you, and you will seem like the redundant variable. Consistency. Consistency is everything. I'm going to do my second where as well today. I'm going to show you two different slides. You can tell me what's different. Slide one, slide two. Slide one, slide two. Slide one, slide two. Now, some of you are going to notice right away that the uh, the, the the font is different, right? It, you know, the location is different, the size is different. But I, when I do this, by the way, one of the funniest things is only towards the end somebody goes, "There are different pictures." You know, that's the most important thing. You know, that's the thing I wanted you to notice that they were different pictures. But what what's interesting is is that anytime something changes, we think it has meaning. Is there any meaning behind the italics here? No, not at all. So let me go show you how to make things as consistently as possible. Now, if I were to do this, the problem I would run into is, is I cannot make the two pictures the same size because they have different aspect ratios. They're different shaped pictures. I can either make them common heights or common widths. And in this country, the answer is common heights are more important. And I say in this country because design is cultural. And we read using parallel horizontal lines, which means we're looking for parallel horizontal lines, which means it's more important for us to have common parallel horizontal lines. Common heights are more important than common widths. But in other countries, in other cultures where they read vertically, strong verticals are more important. And it's very important to realize how important culture is to design. Figure one, figure two. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Figure one, figure two. Just beautiful. And if you put them up together, line everything up. Just line it up. It's simple as that. Now, this next part of the presentation is very controversial. Listen carefully. This isn't a paper. You don't need to footnote or annotate it. Oh, my God. And, and I can prove it to you, right? Because when I'm reading a paper, when I'm giving a paper, I don't go, uh, Johnson in the Journal of American Medicine, Volume 42, Huffington Movement, 1957. You don't read the citation aloud. This isn't a paper. You're, you're delivering, you're delivering material. The, the citations come later. You don't need to put them right here. This isn't a painting on a wall, and your tombstone doesn't go in the corner. Because generally, if they can't read it, you shouldn't write it. Simple as that. Why is that such a big deal? Why is putting fine print on the screen a useful thing? It drives me insane. On that note, how many of you have done this? On the end of your slides, put a little thing. And what does it mean? I love this. Because they can't read it. They can't write it down. All you're doing is flashing, I had sources. I, I, I knew that. We didn't think you made it up. And if we did, a slide isn't going to prove it to us otherwise. Some people will go, well, my professor makes me uh, include the slide but not show it. At least I give you that. Oh, it's for the print. Oh, for the printout. We'll get back to the printout. Drives me nuts. If you can't read it, don't, if they can't read it, don't write it. Simple as that. Here it is. American Gothic, Grant Wood, 1930. Oil on beaver board. For years, I would go, anybody know what beaver board is? And finally, someone explained it to me. 29.25 by 24.5 inches. Do I need to include the dimensions? Oh, that's a good question. It goes back to another, another thing. How many uh, chambers does the heart have? I love this question, right? People read, read the answer. Do I need to cite that? Do I need to cite how many chambers the heart has? You will no. Why not? Common knowledge. Whose common knowledge? Not my common knowledge. Because technically, if it's my common knowledge, I wouldn't have to cite anything. I knew all this. Common knowledge is the common knowledge of the audience. And the audience is going to basically be a context of where you give information. 
What you would have to cite to a group of physicians is different than when you'd have to cite to a group of art historians. And let me tell you, in a group of art historians, if you show a piece of art, you damn well better include the dimensions. And based on that convention, this is what your slides letter look like. Because the reality of it is, as much as this is wrong from a design perspective, this is the convention in art history. So what I tell you is, is if your discipline has a convention, follow it. Push it, be better and better and better. But at the same time, if they don't, don't do things that you shouldn't do. Now, there's something else that we can learn from art historians, though. And actually, there's an entire range of academic disciplines, which are really the red fields. What that means is, is that when they go to conferences and they give a presentation, they're not just going to throw their PowerPoint up and speak off the cuff. They're actually going to read their papers, English, art history, political science, history. They literally read their papers. And that may sound terribly dull at first, but trust me, I have seen some truly dynamic professors throw back their jackets, pull out their paper, and really give some delivery. Now, what's neat about this is that we can learn something from them, and it takes the average person two minutes to read a single sheet of double spaced paper, which means if you've got to give a 10 minute presentation, that's around five pages of double spaced material. And so this gives you a sense of scope, and it's very useful if you're trying to figure out how much content, because you know what five pages of material feels like. You know what 10 pages of material feels like. Matter of fact, that's one of the biggest difficulties we run into. You've written a 20 page term paper, but you've been asked to give a 10 minute presentation. You've got 40 minutes of content and you're only supposed to deliver five. So this idea that you're building up and cutting back often becomes confusing. So when it comes time to give a presentation, if you have 20 pages of content, but you only can deliver five, then only deliver five. One of the things that comes up often when I'm giving a presentation is I might run out of time. I might notice that I'm running out of time. And let me tell you something, it is better to skip than to speed up. Because if you speed up, the audience sees you speeding up, the audience sees you ruining the content. But if you skip, they don't know what you skipped. And remember, they only know what you give them. I mentioned earlier about culture and design, and I wanna mention a quick shout out to our international students. I love my international students. And what I love about them is, is that no one wants to talk about how brave they are. How brave is it to stand up and speak to a group of people in a language that isn't your first language? That is awesome. And that is difficult. And because of that, you're often likely to include more information because you feel weaker in your language. And let me tell you, don't, don't. The best way to make somebody listen to you is to make them listen to you. To remember that you are brave. Matter of fact, you know what? For those of you who English is your first language, you're brave too. It's not easy. Not everybody feels comfortable standing up in front of a group of people and speaking. Some people, it is absolute terror to stand in front of a group of people. Matter of fact, people make mistakes. I've made mistakes today. I have made mistakes. And you know what? I've just kept going. And that's what I do. And the reality of it is, is that for the most part, if you say something stupid, you just correct yourself and you move on. There's no reason to feel bad. There's no reason to back up. There's no reason to flee. I've seen people do it, by the way. I see people actually flee the podium. They actually start to back away from the audience the more mistakes they make. You know what? We are human. We are human. We make mistakes. And if I'm giving a presentation and right in the middle of it, I say the word poopy. This isn't video. No one's going to go poopy, poopy. Oh, wait, this is video. You could do poopy, poopy, poopy. You know what? The reality of it is, at the end of this video, if all you remember is that I said poopy a bunch of times in the middle of the video, that's really, it's like looking at my tie. At the end of the day, it's not what matters. What matters is, is what did you learn? What did you take away? What was important to you? And that's really, really important, is that you need to be dependent. You need to be a dependent part of this thing, not dependent on the PowerPoint, but a very integral part of the PowerPoint. We move on to another segment called The Power of Words. Now, I am going to start off by saying a picture of a thousand words. Go. What do you see? Seriously, take a moment. I'm going to drink some water. What did you see? 
I've been doing this for years. I know exactly what you saw. You saw a shoe. You saw a dog. Old dog or young dog? What kind of shoe? You got that. Everyone goes, Nike. There's a swoosh. They see the shoe. What color dog? What breed dog? The idea is that you spend a lot of time with words, but it takes a time for you to really think about what it is that you're looking at. But you know what? I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let my slideshow tell the story instead. Now, we did not have him stuffed, by the way. Let me, let me back up for a moment. Um, this is my dog, Bandit. By the way, did you think it was my dog? I showed it at the beginning. I showed it now. Did you think it was my dog? Did you say it was my dog? So one of the most important things is a lot of people will go, oh, I, I thought it was your dog, but I didn't say it was your dog. It's, uh, it's a really interesting subtlety here. A lot of times I will have to tell the audience something that they know, that I know they know. But it's in the back of their head, but it needs to be in the front of their head, or maybe even worse, they need them to be able to sing it. So it's okay to hold up a mirror to your audience and ask them to say something that you know they know. I have to tell you that this is my dog, even though I know you know it's my dog. It's okay you to say it's my dog. And this is my dog, Bandit. And he was 18 and a half years old in this photo. And he's sleeping in this photo, by the way. He's not dead. Uh, he's sleeping in this photo, and this is the day before my brother had to put him down, 18 and a half years old. By the way, no such thing as a white dog. You put him out in the snow, you know this. Half Cocker Spaniel, half big white fluffy dog. Uh, he did die the very next day, and we did not have him stuffed. Though, I always joked about having him stuffed. That was actually sort of a running gag, because um, when he was a puppy, and I was eight years old, uh, he had epilepsy, and they told me he was going to die. We well, about one or two years old. So I kind of thought, oh my God, um... When he dies, do we have him stuffed? Do we get a new one? And so I always joke that we're going to have him stuffed, and we never did. But I want to go back to this little bit of a thing about here, about the difference in the images that we look at here, is that how does the words change the picture? A dog, my dog, an old dog, a dead dog, a stuffed dog. See how that works? Words change pictures. The results of our study, the successful results of our study, we cured cancer. Like, again... Your job is to spin, but not to lie. And I want you to realize, that if you look, I am just relaying facts. That's it. I relay facts. No, you're not. Facts have a point of view. The order in which you place the facts down have a point of view. Just not having a point of view is a point of view. You are not just relaying facts. You're making an argument. Do not think you're not doing that. All right. Advanced presenting requires practice. I, uh, isn't it cute? I hate the laser pointer. I hate the laser pointer. Who uses a laser pointer? And when you use the laser pointer, you shine the bright red laser on the screen and people look away. They look away. They look away. They can't stand to look at the, the laser because they, they linger too long. And by the way, why would I use a laser pointer? I have a mouse. I can point with my mouse. Or I could come down here and I could come down here and I could grab the pen and I could do da 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 da. People always hate when I do this. Like, look at that. I can do that little, little pitchfork here. Who gets really mad when I do this? All right, fine, fine, fine. I can come down here, and I could grab the highlighter, and I can give a little halo, because all dogs go to heaven. All right, so I have some fun with this. I draw on, the, on, the, on everything I see on the screen. By the way, if you're going to draw on the screen, you have to be prepared. To, to be spontaneous, you have to be rehearsed. It is not easy to just to start doodling on the screen and, and feel good about it. But you can do that. There's a lot of cool things over here, by the way. I can erase all the ink. By the way, there's a laser pointer. Look at There's a laser pointer right here on the screen. I could use the laser pointer. Uh, and, of course, I can come over here and erase all the ink on the slide. Kind of fun to be able to doodle on the screen. Again, you want to have an idea of what you're going to do. You want it, to, again, not to be overly spontaneous. It wants to look spontaneous, but it has to be uh, a little bit less than that. Now, custom animations. Only... Use them if you need them. And let me turn off my little, uh, let me turn off my little laser pointer. There we go. Oh, where, let me turn off my laser pointer. How do I turn off my laser pointer? There it is. Custom animations. Only use them if you need them. And let me tell you what I mean. So, 
I have owned goldfish. Have you ever owned goldfish? Because I've owned goldfish. If you've owned goldfish, you'll know that the story is 100% true. But if you've never owned goldfish, someone else will tell you that it is true. But I promise you, this is a true story. So I would never owned fish before. Uh, I just never did. And I decided when I was in college, I was going to get some fish. And uh, after uh, I got a fish, I got a fish bowl. And it turns out that you are not supposed to name the fish. You know why you're not supposed to name the fish? Because they die. But I named them anyway, and every day I would come home and I would do this. Now, what did I have? I had I had Goldie, and I had Spot, of course, had a Spot, and I had Jose, and I had Juan, and I had Two, and I had Pepe. And these were the fish, and I could tell you which fish were which. And by the way, this is not a joke. These were actually the names of my fish. I had Goldie, Spot, Jose, Juan, Two, and Pepe. And every day we would come, come home and we would count the number of fish. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, five, six. It was just like a running gag. And people were like, why would you count them? Don't they just float up the top if they die? Not always. Sometimes they get eaten by the other fish. Sometimes they get caught in the filter. But anyway, it was our, it was our ritual. We'd come home. We'd count the number of fish. And I thought to myself, I know what would be funny. If instead of coming home to six fish or fewer, we came home to more than six fish. So I went to the store and I bought a seventh goldfish. And you're supposed to, like, balance it in the water and do this whole thing. I didn't have time for that. I just threw him in the water, and I called him Lucky because I figured it would be lucky if he lived through the night. Now, the funny part is, is, is uh, the, the, she comes home. We count to seven. My girlfriend laughs. It's a big funny ha-ha-ha. And that was, again, now years later, now a year later, when the tank turned orange and the, all the fish started to die, Lucky was the last to go. It was really funny. Like, Lucky, Lucky, you can make it. And Lucky didn't, didn't but he was the last to die. Now, Think about that story for a moment. Did I need to animate? What didn't I animate? The classic blunder is to animate everything on the slide, which means that the actual um, goldfish bowl would have shown up at the end after I was done telling my story. That wouldn't make any sense. That that's That's horrible. But did I need to space it out? I mean, yes, there's a, a slight pun in the names Juan and Two, and that, well, it's kind of a nice reveal, but I could have just put all six fish on the... If I had put all seven fish on the screen, you'd have been like, wait, why is there Lucky on the screen? Why didn't you talk about Lucky? I could have put Lucky on the next slide. I could have had six and then one. I didn't need to use the custom animations, but I did because it was part of my spiel. That being said, I wanted to ask yourself, what came up first, the name or did I say it? And the answer is, I said it. Because I didn't follow the PowerPoint, the PowerPoint followed me. And how did I do that? Well, I knew what I was going to say. How did I know I was going to say? I memorized it. Or maybe I had another screen up that would, that would preview for me. Or maybe I had printed notes. All of those are different ways, but you need to be one step ahead of the PowerPoint. It, it's not you following the PowerPoint. It's the PowerPoint following you. That is the number two trick to PowerPoint. And again, animate when you need to animate. I could have had six and one, but never the fishbowl, because I didn't need to animate the fishbowl. Transitions. Don't use them. Don't use them. Don't use them. Seriously, don't use them. For transitions to work, they have to have meaning. There are three P's to PowerPoint, as I like to th th say, think about it. Pacing, pausing, and punch. The reality of it is, is you want to have a rhythm to your PowerPoint. That's the pacing. The pausing is the fact that I pause. I do pause. People accuse me of not pausing. They go, you don't stop talking. Oh, I stop talking, but when I pause, you're thinking, so you don't know to interrupt me. And punch is the emphasis that you want to think about. Speaking as you do, delivering information as you do, you are the one who is going to thread the space between the PowerPoints to make the space between those slides invisible. But a transition, it augments the space. Nothing happens in the space. It is like, I speak, I wait, I speak, I wait. It's deadly. Transitions, even in film, should have meaning. A change in time, a change in place. There's something, that a meaning about them. But transitions, all they do is they eat time and they ruin your rhythm. So don't do it. Next, the magic. What are you selling? Everybody's selling something. What are you selling? Everybody walked in the room believing one thing. They walk out of the room believing something else. What is it? What are they selling? 
Ooh, here's a good one. I have an English knock-knock joke. Knock-knock. And you go, who's there? I go, two. And you go, to who? And I go, to whom? <laughs> there you go. Not just what are you selling, but who's in the audience? Who are you selling it to? It's not this thing, like, oh, I want everyone. No, it's not everyone. A certain group of people are listening to you. Knowing your audience is critical to being able to be persuasive to that audience. Good pedagogy. Oh, what is good pedagogy? Good po pedagogy is repetition. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you, then I'm going to tell you what I told you, then I'm going to tell you why it matters. Repetition. And the overture method. Oh, my God, I love the overture method. The overture method. Ever go to a musical and they play an overture? The overture is great. Why do they have an overture? Well, they have an overture for two reasons. The first one is so can everyone find their seats. But the real reason for an overture is one of the most insidious psychological things out there. So one of the things about overture method uh, method is when you go to hear an overture all of the melodies for the entire musical are embedded in that overture when you hear that melody later on your brain goes i know that melody because as a creature of as a machine we crave to know that we're alive and one of the ways we know that we're alive is pattern matching memory and recall and this is very simple that if you can remember it and then you know match it up you go i've heard that melody before it must be right and if you don't believe me a couple of years ago in the freedman center it's a scholarship center that we have we used to be the language lab and people would come in and they'd ask if if they could learn a modern language and we used the pinsler language system at the time and somebody walked in and said excuse me do you have the rosetta stone here and we like we use the pinsler language system and they go oh uh, I wanted to use a Rosetta Stone because I heard it was the fastest way to learn a language. And I'm like, yeah, from them. That's their slogan. Rosetta Stone, comma, the fastest way to learn a language. They'd heard it so many times that they didn't remember who said it. They just remembered that they'd heard it. That's the power of advertising. But the overture method is great. What I will do is I will tell you all the things that you're going to hear. And then 20 minutes later, when I tell you them, you're going to go, I've heard that somewhere before. It must be right. Yes, it was me. Uh, the other thing that we do is we also have the story method. I love the story method as well. You remember in high school when they had the witch's hat? You know, the introduction and the rising action and the falling action, the denouement and the climax. You are telling a story. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. You can tell. You can even tell right now that I'm getting over the, the hump. I'm wrapping things up. I'm getting further down the road. You don't speak at the same level the whole way through. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. What is the story you're going to tell? By the way, one of the favorite methods is for me is when I mix the two up. The overture method is fun. When I talk about the over overture, overture method and the story method, I tell everybody we're going to climb a mountain. Together, we're going to climb that mountain. And you all look at me like, no, we're not. And then afterwards, I go, hey, everybody, remember when I told you we're going to climb the mountain? It's behind us. You're like, oh, my God, it's behind us. That's kind of a fun thing to do as well. It's kind of neat to kind of call your shots as you go. Now, this next slide is the most important slide of the entire presentation. It's the one that you really came for. Bullets. Bullets. How to make the perfect bullets. It's very simple. No grammar. No punctuation. No sentences. And you're like, what? That's it. Grammar and punctuation are the polish that turn ideas into sentences, sentences into paragraphs. At the end of the day, if you put a sentence on that screen, you will read it. And that's the end of it. It's, it's terrible. If you read a sentence and they read a sentence, then what do you need to be there for? You're going to be beholden to that sentence. You're going to have to say that sentence. But if you only put an idea on the screen, an idea, you can turn that sentence into whatever you, that idea into whatever sentence you want. You can make it a long idea. You can make it a short idea. Think about the notes that you're taking, if you're taking notes. Think about the notes you've taken in another presentation. Are they ever full sentences? No. They're keywords. They're concepts. They're the things that you want to know. Think about the bullets as the, the, the notes you take for your audience. Now, obviously, if there's names, dates, places, facts, figures, you've got to put them on the screen. No question. But ideas, ideas, simply summarize what it is that you need to know. And that's the best part. It's because they'll listen to you. If I put up a word on the screen, 
I, I don't just read the word. I, I turn it into a story and then it goes back to that word. And that's how you create control. It also, by the way, means when people say to me, Jared, can I get a copy of your slides? And I go, <laughs> if, if you weren't there, the slides would be meaningless. And if you were there, you wouldn't want them. No all caps, all caps in a digital age is yelling. All right. No underline. I'm, I really hate underline. Underline is, is a, it means a hyperlink. I always want to click when I see an underline. It's like the, the land of underlineville. Don't use underline. Bold is good, and italics is okay, depending on the font. Emphasis is useful, but again, keep things simple. All right. Technology guidelines. Use the layouts. There are layouts built into PowerPoint. Use them. Don't start whole cloth. Don't start inserting anything. Start clean. Use the layouts. Use the title slide, the title and content, to content comparison, fill in the blanks, but don't modify anything. It's not time to polish yet. Get all your content in as is. Don't tweak anything. Get it nice and clean in the content boxes, simple text. Don't do anything. No changes in colors, no changes in anything. And then when you're done, we can use the design template to change everything. Because if you only use the title, the content boxes, then this will cascade all the changes, which is amazing. We can then customize the colors and the fonts, and only then can you insert an override. Can you change things? Can you modify things as needed? Now, use printed notes. You cannot rely on the fact that where you go, that the presenter mode is going to work. You're never quite sure if there's going to be two monitors or if it's always going to be the exact same monitor in front of you. So printed notes is the best way to go. Proof, practice, and test it on a PC. If you're a Mac user and you're, you're, there's a possibility you're going to be presenting on a PC, you're not your own PC, make sure you've moved it to a PC and tested it before you've done it. Just the way things work. I'm not Mac bashing, by the way. Microsoft's the one who made the flawed program on the Mac. Proof, practice, and test it on a PC. Last slide, no surprises. So many people look surprised at their own presentations. Oh, I hate this. When my students see this, they're like, and next we have, oh my God, who made your presentation if you can be surprised by your own damn slides? But the real trick is, is you want a slide as a speed bump. You want a thank you slide. You want a thank you slide so you don't prematurely end your presentation. What comes after the thank you slide? And we know if I hit next, I'm going to go into the PowerPoint interface. But when you're giving a presentation, what comes next? And the answer is Q&A. Who do you want to be during the Q&A? Because let me tell you, if I press next one more time and the screen goes black and PowerPoint comes up, the room will get louder. The presentation is over. You burst the bubble of the presentation, and now the Q&A is after the presentation. But I want my Q&A part of the presentation, so I'm not leaving PowerPoint, which means I'm not ending this until I say I'm ending this. So it's very important that you have that speed bump slide. Also, it's polite. It says, thank you, got your name. But more importantly, during the Q&A, if somebody goes, excuse me, can you go back to, well, if I come back and ask any question, I right-click. I can literally go and say, see all slides. And I can actually have random access to any slide that I want. And I can go jump right to it as part of my argument. And that's what's very useful. You get to use your PowerPoint as part of your Q&A. And the Q&A, again, is part of your presentation. And you are still the sage on the stage. You are still in charge. And the Q&A carries the same weight as the rest of your presentation, which is very important. Because, again, you want it to be part of your presentation not after your presentation. Very, very important. But we're not done yet. I've mentioned a whole bunch of things, but I want to go over just a few more items. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to close. I'm going to do it right here. I'm going to press escape. I'm up. I'm in PowerPoint. Yay, I'm in PowerPoint. Now that I'm in PowerPoint, I'm going to create a new PowerPoint. I'm going to show you about a couple of things that will make your life really easy on how to make PowerPoint really, really work for you. All right, so now let's do it. Let's actually go into PowerPoint and go over some of the things that I like to see. All right, file, new, blank presentation. I always start nice and blank. 
Now, it, it, we live in a modern age. When I started making PowerPoints, our screens were different aspect ratios. They were 4 by 3, and now they're 16 by 9. Matter of fact, if I go over to Design, you're going to come over here and see Slide Size, 4 by 3 or 16 by 9. We default to 16 by 9. We are a widescreen format. That's the way it works. Just wanted you to know that's the way it works. I'm going to come back over to Home, and I'm going to come over here and type in My First PowerPoint. Silly here by, by Jared Bendis. All right, good. Now, interestingly enough, I'm actually really thrilled about this. My name is not underlined in red. You know why my name would be underlined in red? Because it's misspelled. No! Underlined in red does not mean misspelled. Underlined in red means that the dictionary does not know what the word is. There's a difference, by the way. If I come over here and cl right click on this, it'll give me suggestions like PowerPoint. Actually, one of my favorites is it says add to dictionary. We used to have a really horrible prank we'd play on people. Don't do this. We would actually like type in like misspelled words and then right click and hit add a dictionary because people wouldn't know that they even had a custom dictionary and then all of a sudden TEH is spelled correctly. It's a horrible prank. Don't do it. Anyway, continuing on, by the way, I am not going to change the font. I'm not going to change the color. I'm not going to move the box. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to leave it alone. New slide. Now, when you're in PowerPoint, I want to point out that there are these boxes here, and there's this little triangle. Now, the little triangle always means, always means, click me, there's more. If I click on the click me, there's more, it's going to tell me what type of new slide I can make. And of course, 90% of the time, everybody makes these wonderful title and content slides. Double tap to add title, and I'm going to come over here and say list of stuff. And then, of course, I can come over here, and in this content box, there are seven types of pieces of information that you can put in here. Seven. People, of course, always talk about the bullets, right? Here is a bullet. That's not the way you want to do it, but there you go. Now, what's funny about this for me is, is that we used to do this thing where we would do a knowledge dump. Knowledge dumps are fun. So if I want to talk about, like, let's say my cats. Cats. I don't have cats anymore. I'm allergic, right? I had a, I had a puppy cat, and I had, and puppy cat was Siamese, uh, and she was loud, uh, and she was needy, and I had a Junior, and she was um, uh, Manx, and she was tailless. Is that how you spell tailless? I think so, um, and she was loud. And she was needy too. Now, that's kind of a bullet list. It's way too many bullets, by the way, but there you go. But you know what's really interesting is, is that there's this process by which you can organize information by promoting and demoting. You can promote something by pressing tab. I mean, you demote it by pressing tab. And so I can come over here and make little double bullets here by tabbing my bullets. So now I've got Puppy Cat and Junior. Puppy Cat is a Manx, and uh, Junior is a Manx, and it's Tailless. And Tailless because she's a Manx, so I can actually do that as well. And uh, she was loud and she was needy. Is that because she was a Manx? No. The opposite of tab, by the way, is shift tab. And I can actually then promote this back if I wanted to. So you can promote and demote by using tab and shift tab. By the way, tab and shift tab work in a lot of places. If you're surfing the web and you're in a form and you press tab to go to the next form field, shift tab will take you backwards. It's the coolest thing. Matter of fact, if you look on the keyboard, you're going to see tab goes this way and shift tab goes this way. It's a trick that a lot of people know. All right, there you go. So, uh, oops, there you go. Now, let's come over here and do another new slide. All right. Now, if you look over here, there are six types of content boxes here. And I want to go over them very quickly. The first one's really, really easy. Insert table. All right, there's a table. Beautiful. That was not a very good table, but at least it allows me to insert a table, and I could have changed the parameters as well. Do another new slide. Uh, the next I can do insert as a chart. Ooh, charts are fun. Anyone know what my favorite type of chart is? It's a pie chart, because I like pie. And I come over here and I can type in a pie and I click OK. And it's going to read up the pie chart, my little Microsoft uh, PowerPoint uh, built-in chart feature, which is kind of neat. I can change the numbers. I can change all the information. And I can come over here and say, I like pie. There you go. Beautiful. So I've got charts, and I've got tables, and I've got pies. I mean, I've got charts. <laughs> all right, next. We're going to skip the next one for a moment. Insert a picture. Now, when you go to insert a picture, 
I'm going to come over here and I'm going to grab a picture. And it's really fun is if I click this picture, it's going to automatically make it fit inside the box, which is pretty awesome because it is part of the box right now. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I don't have to do anything else with that, but it's kind of neat. We come back over to home and I'm going to do another new slide. And this time instead of, I can do online pictures such as clip art. I can insert video. Video is a whole other beast, but just, it works just the same. Just be nice and slow with it. What I want to show you, of course, is the smart art graphics. Smart art graphics are awesome. They're heavily overused and you really have to spend time trying to understand, just like with charts. Charts have meanings. Did you know charts have meanings? Even before I typed in a damn number, if you see a pie chart, what does that really tell you? The answer is there's 100% of something and I'm dividing it up. And so when you use charts, if you're a number person, you know that there's right charts for the right job. The same thing kind of goes with the smart art graphics, whether you're going to use a cycle or a matrix or any of these types of things. You really got to figure out which of these is going to tell your story. So I'm going to do some food groups, right? Food, food groups. Bacon. Salmon. Olives. Oh, I don't want to do that. But if I come over here and I press enter, now I'm going to get more. I can do sugar and I can do soda, right? So I can do it this way as well. It's kind of neat how you can do these things. All right. Now, I told you there's other types of slides out there. There's the two content slide, which is great because I can actually put in two images at the same time. So I could come over here and do a banana on this side and I could do a kitten on this side. Now, you see how that picture is small? The reason that picture is small is because there isn't enough resolution to make it big. Now, you could make it bigger, and a lot of people know that if you drag it by the corner, it'll get bigger. But instead of dragging it by the corner and having it get bigger, I'm gonna undo that. I'm gonna hold the shift key down. If you hold the shift key down, it, not the shift key, if you hold the control key down, it actually gets bigger from the middle, which I love, by the way, isn't that awesome? So come back over to home, new slide. And again, I can change the layout of the slide to comparison. By the way, comparison allows me to come over here and have not just uh, two images, but two images with um, two subtitles was very useful as well. So I could come over here and decide that I'm going to have uh, this chart over here and this uh, graphic over here. And you can see it starts to get quite interesting. Of course, I can come over here and type in a one and two and compare. So much content here. And again, so much content. Now, kitten. I'm just filling in all the blanks. All right. So now that I've done this, I can come over here, new slide. Now, when you see the title slides, they don't always have to be at the beginning and the end. You can actually have them where you only have one piece of information, like meanwhile dot 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 you know it can have other meaning it doesn't i can kind of throw that up here and so but it doesn't just have to be at the beginning and the end it's just a single idea all right um those are the four that i like to use i'm going to avoid some of the other ones as as, as we go forward all right but i will need to come over here and type in a, and add a new slide that says thank you now that I've done this, now that I've gotten some basic idea of what my content is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over down here to the slide sorter view. I love the slide sorter because it allows me to rearrange things. Remember, I have things are so loose here that I can decide to put them in any order I want whenever I want. And that's going to make your life a lot easier. Having the slide sorter is having minimal information allows you to rearrange things. And that's very useful. All right. So now that I've done that, I'm going to come back over to, and I'm, I'm sure everything I need is here. I'm sure everything I need is here. Now I'm going to come over to design. And what I can do is I can choose one of these designs that if I click on it will cascade to the entire presentation. And again, if I have to, and notice that things are moving. You see that things are rearranging themselves here because it moves the text boxes for you as you go. And if you decide all of a sudden that you really like the way this looks, but damn it, I wish the colors were better. Well, then you come over here and you do the, the drop down and you can choose one of a variety of color schemes, one of a variety of font schemes, 
and of course even effect schemes and they're all right here it's so quick and easy and now that I'm really close to the way I want it to look now I can come back over here and decide it's time to override things now I can use the insert command to do things like insert another text box or insert another and again if you trust PowerPoint it'll trust you and that will make your life a little bit easier so now I can override things I can also come over here and format my pictures and I can add all sorts of borders these are the fancy borders or I could just come over to picture border and do weight and just do one simple quarter border and there it is and that'll make your life again a lot easier so I'm gonna come over here and that's by the way it was reverted so I'll hit the control key and make it big until it snaps into place there it is and then I can click the picture format picture border weight quarter point format picture border weight quarter point and now those images will stand out so much better simple as that it's really 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 easy all right so remember we don't use transitions um, but if we are going to use animations we're going to come over here we're going to click on animations and we're going to decide what sort of animation we want most of the time I use very very simple animations I use the uh, fly-in animations I don't do the fades or the appears certain things show up better than others I like the fly-ins and there you go it shows up and it kind of shows you what you're doing and you can even click reorder animation um, I like to bring up the animation pane which will actually show me all the different things that are coming in and you'll see that if I click over here it tells me that it, what it's gonna when I click this this is what comes up when I click this is come up and this is when I click this is gonna come up and you can really decide exactly what comes up with what how many clicks you can do really complicated things here if you really want to learn to use these animations you have to learn to practice more though so again I'm really really shy about it matter of fact what I tell people is is you want to be very very careful about using animations because again you can really um, you can really mess it up and so I'm gonna come over here and delete them I'm literally deleting all the animations from this so it just everything pops on the screen at the same time you really have to practice with it you have to have a really good idea of what it is you're trying to build and then build with it accordingly all right so a couple other things that I want to talk about we mentioned um, handouts don't be an idiot about handouts there is no silver bullet for handouts file print now for some people this is what they're used to seeing one slide on a page or you could come over here and you could do what's called the standard everyone loves this three slides in the notes nobody wants this nobody wants this and by the way I never ever give my PowerPoint to somebody ahead of time think about it you lose all narrative you lose all surprises you lose all your jokes you, you grab it you're like that's not funny that's not interesting that's not good this is gonna be a waste of my time I have my notes I can leave don't ruin your presentation by giving them this PowerPoint ahead of time I, I, and again and when they do ruin it for them they didn't want this they only wanted this damn slide right over here you know which slides they want printed print those it's the chart it's the graph it's the bibliography so you know what the handout should be the chart the graph the bibliography if you've got something that's so important that they're gonna need to want to write down the entire thing then you should have a title a title uh, thing you should have just the information they need and instead of giving them walk away with 20 pages a few little boxes have them walk away with three pages that are big and clear and exactly what they want everyone if you turn to page two of the handout you'll oh, thank God that they just gave me what I needed that's what you want to do don't ruin your narrative thread by printing out your PowerPoints and giving it to the audience personally when I'm giving a presentation I tend to go for the six slide view so that I have a miniature copy of my entire presentation or I will do what's called the notes page you're like notes page what's down here Ooh, it's so much fun the notes page if I were to come over here and view the notes the notes page is down here and with the notes I can come over here and I can type stuff now they can't see the stuff and I'm not gonna be able to see it on the screen but if I were to come over here and do file print and look at the notes page you're gonna be able to see the notes are right here and that's gonna be really really useful for you as well so I kind of shown you how to throw it all together and it's kind of fun to do it 
you already know how to use PowerPoint. The trick is to use PowerPoint the way that Microsoft wants you to use PowerPoint. The trick is to respect the layouts. That if you respect the layouts, you can apply the design templates and make everything work faster for you. Keep it simple. But I need to have three items. No, you don't. No, you don't. Don't get overly complicated here. If you're a great graphic designer, phenomenal. Then why are you watching this video? I'm here to simplify your life. I'm here to make your life easier. I'm here to make it so that you can focus in on what you need to focus in on, which is your content and your presentation. Now, lastly, go through, double check everything, play through the slideshow. There's your slideshow. You can do it all, get it all going. Practice, 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 practice. Should I have a script? I wouldn't. If you're a great performer, that's one thing, but most of the time when people work from a script, you can tell they're working from a script. You want to know what you're going to say. You want to roughly know what you're going to say. You want to have an outline. If you view the bullets as an outline, you want to have outline for that outline. What are the things that you need to hit? That's what's going to be important. I want to talk about one last thing, and that is group PowerPoints. I hate group presentations. I hate group presentations because people tend to not trust each other. We need to learn to trust each other. If you're presenting with somebody else, then you need to make sure that they know what they're saying and you know what you're saying and they're responsible for their part and you're responsible for your part. And you're not going to go over, they're not going to go over. You need to be gracious with each other. You need to not step on each other. And that happens with practice and trust. And let me tell you something, if you don't practice, if you don't know what it is you're going to say, if you think you're just going to stand up there and wing it, you're going to miss half the things that you're going to say. Ooh, I have one last thing. It's one of my favorites. At some point during your presentation, you're going to feel the need to speed up. It's really speed up. And you usually feel that need when you get to something that you think everybody knows. Oh, I should get through this. They already know it. That's usually when you get to the stuff that they don't know, and it's most interesting to them. Usually when you get to the stuff that's really special to you, you get so imposter syndrome that you're sure that everyone already knows this, that you try to rush through the good stuff. When you feel that you're starting to rush, slow down. When you feel that you're starting to rush, slow down and give it as much clarity as it's needed to give people what it is that they're there to hear. They're there to hear you. They're there to hear you. So you want to make sure that you give them every opportunity to hear you. Don't let the PowerPoint undermine you. Make it support you. Talk to your audience. Be responsive. Be responsible. And again, don't be afraid. There's no reason to be afraid. Just keep breathing. Just keep swimming. And you'll be just fine. Hey, I have one last thing. It's really important. Probably the most important thing I'm going to tell you. This is about you. And I really, really want you to find your speaking voice. I know that I make it easy. Uh, my speaking voice is my speaking voice. This is me. I walk down the street. I'm like, hey, how you doing? And you can't just be me. I'm not asking you to be me. I don't want you to walk up in front of a group of people going, hey, how you doing? I'm Jared. You're not Jared. You're you. And you need to find you. You need to find the public speaking you. By the way, you already know that you. That version of you exists. It probably exists when you're hanging out with your buddies, when you're hanging out with your friends, when you're at dinner and you're telling an anecdote and there's no ums and there's no wells and there's no whatever. You're just you. You're just the most active dynamic you there is. And what you need to do is start paying attention. You need to start floating away and seeing yourself being you and say, how am I going to be me in other environments? How do I be me just as comfortably in front of a group of people telling them what it is that they need to hear as I am and when I'm having dinner with my friends? And that's the challenge. Find you. And I invite you to find you. It's a really, really fun experience because you can sit there and going, is that what I sound like? Is that what I look like? And your friends go, yeah, and that's what we love about you. That's who you are. And so you've got to not shy away from being you. 
You've got to not be afraid of your audience, not be afraid of your content. You just have to sit there going, I know my stuff and I know who I am and I'm going to present it to these people who really want to hear it from me. And with that, I say, good luck, kick some ass. My name's Jared.